It's the first weekend of May and we're still waiting for spring, so it ought to be a great summer. I'm Charlie Sykes. Sunday Insight starts right now. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Insight. In the week that was, remember that massive UW slush fund? It's about to grow by another $150 million. May Day marches in Milwaukee and around the country call for immigration reform, but legislation may be in trouble. Aaron Rodgers becomes the highest paid player in NFL history. The unemployment rate nationally drops to 7.5%, but across the country there are reports of part-time workers having their hours cut because of Obamacare. Three more arrests in connection with the bombing of the Boston Marathon. Senator Ron Johnson calls for new congressional hearings on the murder of four Americans in Benghazi, and no, it wasn't because of the video. The president is asked whether he still has the juice to get his agenda through. A new study says that single parenthood now costs Wisconsin taxpayers more than $700 million a year. NBA player Jason Collins publicly acknowledges he's gay and gets a phone call from the president. But we start with the latest Milwaukee County Board follies. On Thursday, County Executive Chris Abley vetoed the board's own reform plan, which was intended to stave off state legislation to cut the board's pay, budget, and powers. That capped a week that saw five county supervisors publicly call for the removal of county board chairwoman Marina Dmitrievich and other board leaders. Also this week, despite repeated denials that the board had been secretly neg negotiating contracts with public employee unions, a report that in fact four such deals had been negotiated and were ready for board approval. When the contracts were revealed, Dmitrievich quickly pulled them from the board's calendar and put them on hold. Joining me on our panel this morning, political strategist and former Milwaukee County Supervisor Linda Bruin, current County Supervisor Deanna Alexander, the Milwaukee Community Journal's Michael Holt, and RightWisconsin.com's Brian Fraley. So, Deanna, since we have you here, can you explain why your colleagues are asking for the removal of the chairman of the county board? You know, Charlie, a good leader is willing to admit when they've made mistakes and just say, hey, you know, I might have made a misstep. Let's find a way to fix this and move forward. That's not being done here. That's a big problem. Okay, let's talk about these, these contracts because, you know, at first it was the question of the negotiations with District Council 48, which is decertified. Then this week we find out four other contracts had been negotiated. What are we dealing with here? I mean, the, the county board had denied that these negotiations were taking place. They clearly were taking place. I mean, there's, there's no doubt, right? I mean, these are negotiations, right? They're, they're not just talks. They're not just exchanges of views. Depends on who you talk to. Yeah. First, we weren't talking to any unions. Right. Then, then we weren't negotiating. We were only yeah. talking. Then Acton hasn't really been solidi solidified, so let's look at what the law is. Then we're only dealing with the certified unions. Now we've got contracts on the table and out there. So, you know, what does the public think about this? I, I think that it's, it's pretty drawn out, and you can come to your own conclusion. Uh, okay. Was the ch leadership of the county board lying to the public and to the legislature about the existence of these negotiations? There's absolutely been misleading of the public, most certainly. Okay, is there a difference between misleading and lying? Well, her first statement to the state legislature was, I don't believe so. Uh, wouldn't a good leader have gone back to check, gotten the right answer, and informed the public of what was going on? Well, especially when the emails show that she was getting it directly. Okay, now, Linda Bruin, you've been on dysfunctional county boards, and by the way, <laughs> who ever thought that, that, that after Lee Holloway, the drama would still con 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 continue? So, what are the prospects? You were part of a movement to have the last chairman of the county board removed, and that didn't work out for you, did it? Right. Unfortunately, if you, uh, in most of county government across the state, and actually other legislative levels as well, you can't remove a sitting county board chairman. Yeah unless they're convicted of a felony. It's that serious. And so the, um, I understand that the supervisors want to express their yeah. um, concern and would like at least to have her step mm -hmm. down. But um, short of being convicted of a felony, there's no legal grounds to remove okay, people. I, I have a political question here because if, if you're a member of the county board, your, your number one priority is to protect yourself, your power, your perks, and your privileges. <laughs> the longer that Marina Dmitrievich stays in office, the more likely it is this county, this uh, state legislation is going to pass and that the referendum them will pass. You would think just out of pure self-preservation, the county supervisor would want to change leadership, wouldn't you? So why aren't they, Brian? That is Fraley? a level of analysis and thinking <laughs> that the majority of the Milwaukee County Board is incapable of making. Mm -hmm. uh, this, although, you know, with all due respect, this is a little bit like saying.
saying let's let's change the captain of the Titanic after mm -hmm. we've hit the iceberg. It it really doesn't matter. I understand it matters from how we can work and get along and everything else. Yeah. But when it comes to the taxpayers and what's going to happen, it doesn't matter. This reform plan is going to pass in Madison, and reform is going to come to the county board from a top-down approach because okay. they refuse to reform themselves. Would this would this county board reform plan have passed the Wisconsin State Legislature if it weren't for the kinds of things that we're seeing from the county board chairwoman and the the misleading the lies about? I'll, the, I'll the be honest union. with you. I I think that this was going to be something that passed the assembly but stalled in the Senate until this negotiations uh, and the uh, ignoring of Act 10. You know, it's, it's, still, it's, still pretty, it's still pretty close. There's, it's not a certainty that this is going to pass the Senate. You know, the assembly is a foregone conclusion. But going back to something, something you said, would this have happened under Lee Holloway? I mean, people didn't like him and they didn't trust him, but Lee Holloway was politically savvy yeah, enough to right. make sure you know, that this board, kind of stuff if, would if not have materialized. If the board, first of all, I left in spring of 2012 and I knew this was coming, that there was going to be state legislation. And so, and so I, there's no excuse for other members of the board not realizing it well. And if they had wanted to really stave this off, if they'd been really savvy, yeah. they would have put forward their own reform plan way back in November no of last year. There was no way that was, was going to happen. Okay. We've yes, also yes. got a situation now where we have the chairwoman of the county board saying, quick, let me look like a leader, and how do I handle this? Oh, I'm not going to put it through to committee. Well, was that the plan all along? Was that the intention? Well, I guess I guess the question is, do, do they internally, do they have a sense of, of, of how dysfunctional, dishonest, and arrogant they look? A lot of people still have their ha heads in the sand, absolutely. Okay, what has your glass half full and what has your glass half empty? Let's go around the table, Linda Bruin, you're first. Well, normally it's fun for me to, and, and my glass is half full when they announce an Emmy and Academy Award nominations, and last week they announced the daytime Emmys. However, my glass is half empty because one of the guys they nominated for per best performer is someone who's had repeated um, public acknowledgments of having sex with underage children, mm -hmm. little children. Yuck. An yeah. Emmy nomination to a pedophile? No thanks. Deanna. Well, my glass is half full because the unemployment rate has gone down to 7.5%. But my glass is half empty because that's still really high compared to where it should be on historical levels. Before the recession, unemployment was only 4.5%. Michael Holt. Half empty. It's official now. Last month was the coldest April in the history of Wisconsin. But my glass is half full because I want a little wee energy stop. Okay, <laughs> Brian Fraley. Uh, glass half full. Palermo's an outstanding Milwaukee company. Wins another round at the Barack Obama supported NLR uh, National Labor Relations Board. Half empty. The uh, pinheads at Vosis de la Frontera cannot accept facts and they're going to continue their protests anyway. Yeah, I'm glad you came up with pinhead and it's uh, something else. Yes. Well, my glass is half full because uh, Senator Ron Johnson and other members of Congress are still pushing for a full investigation into what happened to those Americans in Benghazi. It is half empty because the Obama administration's stonewall continues. Still ahead on Sunday Insight, a Wisconsin church throws the flag on former Packer Leroy Butler. And as we go to break, some humor from last weekend's correspondence dinner. I go out on the basketball court, took 22 shots, <laughs> made two of them. That's right. Two hits, 20 misses. The executives at NBC asked, what's your secret? <laughs>
I won't do that. That's taking my dignity. Mike Michael Holt, who is right here? The church, which stood up for its beliefs, or Leroy Butler, who stood up for his? Well, the church has the right to stand up for beliefs. Sure. As you know, my mother's a minister, my sister's a minister, my brother's a minister, my brother-in-law's a minister, my uncle's a minister. And in our religion, we believe that you hate the sin, but you love the sinner. And the church should be a place of tolerance. So from that perspective, Leroy Butler was correct. And if you want to start nitpicking and saying that because he supports gay rights, he used to speak in the church. So I mean, if you're, you're pro-choice, that means if you don't, if you believe that women should be silent in the church, you can't speak in the church. I mean, the Bible has a very strict regimented tenets that I think half of us be excluded based upon something. Okay, another. Brian Fraley. Look, no one's covering themselves in glory here, the church. Leroy Butler's not a victim, okay? He didn't get his $8,500 for a speech on yeah. bullying. I don't really feel sorry for him. Look, the, the bottom line is you have an, you have an athlete that uh, doesn't do very well uh, in his uh, profession, but is a professional athlete, and give him yeah. credit for that. Uh, and his personal beliefs should have absolutely no bearing on how we accept. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm sorry, that was Tim Tebow. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> back to this other guy. Um, you know, when it first became news, my first reaction was, who? And my second reaction was, who cares? Well, I, mean, okay. I don't think people really care. Well, well exactly. it became a, isn't big, that a big thing. Okay, Wait, I'm sorry. I, I, well, I, I think it's actually more serious than that. Look, I, I'm a Christian, and I think that uh, this church actually is guilty of some trying, attempting to bully Leroy Butler. They should have done their homework. I, they have the right to, to not want him to speak, but if they'd done their homework, uh, Butler had spoken out about in support of gay rights mm. before, and if they really didn't want him, they should have you know, decided not to ask him to begin with. And uh, my understanding is he donates that speech speaking fee anyway, so I don't think there was a financial interest in it for Butler as much as the fact that he just thought they made the wrong call and were trying to bully him and he wanted to, he spoke out about okay, it. Okay, Deanna Alexander. If everyone's going to be tolerant, we have to be equally tolerant mm -hmm. to the church. I think the church should have still had him come, whether he spoke or not, paid him the fee they had agreed to if, you know, it was that close to the, to the date, and at a minimum, you know, sinners are the people who are supposed to go to church. Talk to him, find out why he believes what he believes, and see if you can make some progress with moving forward the conversation. I, mean, I, I think, you know, for, first of all, this whole the, the, the whole story was was grossly overhyped. I mean, so the sure. president of the United States is going to call one basketball player because he says it. So no other mm -hmm. professional athlete did anything that was noble or courageous or generous enough to award it. But but when you come out and you say I want to have sex with men, that gets you a call from the president. It was way overhyped. On the other hand. This particular story, you know, Leroy Butler, I think, is a class act. He's a stand-up guy. And when they went back to him and they said, you know, you know, back, take off your tweet, apologize, do all those things, it was challenging his manhood. And i got to say, I disagree with you, Brian. I think he kind of covered himself with glory. Whether you agree or not agree, he was, they were, you know, he stood up for at least what he believed. I think it's an overhyped story, again. Mm -hmm. But on, you know, Leroy Butler, how could he have looked at himself in the mirror if he had caved into that? It's now, true. you may not want to hear it, but we're going to tell you anyway. Let's diss out some unsolicited advice. Linda Bruin, you are first. Well, did you hear about the man who spent $2,600 at a carnival game trying to win an Xbox Connect that's valued at $100? <laughs> My advice to him is, well, I think you probably have a gambling problem. But second of all, don't go on TV and tell the entire world that you were that dumb. Yeah, the guy's going to end up in Congress. Uh, Deanna Alexander. Girls don't need to show it all to be successful or, or move on in life and show talent. I think Beyonce needs to put some clothes on and live up to being a real role model. Michael Hall. I, I get this idea from TMJ News last week. Next week is Mother's Day, fellas. Don't buy your mother a weed whacker or a mop. <laughs> Brian Fraley. Okay, to uh, school districts like Kenosha, who are upset that their finances are starting to be exposed as uh, conservative groups like EAG News uh, puts them online, uh, get used to it because there's a lot more coming. Uh, my unsolicited advice for the Walker administration, uh, next time hire a qualified CFO for the uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. You guys cannot screw this up again. Next on Sunday Insight, the way is clear for a union vote at Palermo's Pizza, so why are people protesting? And as we go to break, more from the president at the Correspondence Dinner. I'm also hard at work on plans for the Obama Library, and some have suggested that uh, we put it in my birthplace, but I'd rather keep it in the United States. <laughs> Did anybody not see that joke coming? <laughs> Show of hands. Only Gallup. <laughs> Maybe Dick Morris.
a legal victory for Palermo's, but no let up in the activist campaign against the local pizza company. The National Labor Relations Board vindicated the pizza company last week, saying that Palermo's had not violated the law when it terminated several undocumented workers. The ruling cleared the way for a union vote among the company's employees, but activists, including Vochas de la Frontera, announced plans for more protests, including one at the home of the Palermo CEO. Student dem uh, demonstrators also briefly occupied the University of Wisconsin-Madison Chancellor's Office, demanding that UW cut its ties with a family-owned Milwaukee business. So Palermo gets a legal clean bill of health, says it's okay with a union vote, but the protests are escalating. Brian Fraley, what is the end game here? It's just about the struggle. No? It's just about the anger. It's just about the protest. Palermo's happens to be the vessel by which Voces de la Frontera is doing this uh, at this at this point. And even though they've been cleared of the wrongdoing and are willing to have the vote, they're going to continue because all they have is anger and all they have is okay. But the, the, the national AFL-CIO is behind this. There is this boycott, yeah. national boycott campaign. What again? What are they hoping to happen? They, you know, if if a union vote is not sufficient for them. What is the end game well, here, Linda Bruin? That's because I, I disagree with you, Brian. It's more than about mm -hmm. the anger. There's, there's some intelligence be behind this that I okay. disagree with strategy-wise, okay. but the bottom line is mm -hmm. they don't have a, they're not going to have a vote because they don't have the votes. Right. So, what, yeah, so what yeah. they're doing they is... They wanted the vote, but now that they, they, they don't think they'll have the and votes why they to do went it, to they last, don't want the Last year they went after Outpost Natural Foods, mm -hmm. trying to get them to pull, and when Outpost wouldn't and uh, was willing to put up signs notifying yeah. consumers about the strike, that wasn't good enough. They called Outpost immoral, and now they're going to UW. They're going to entities that contract with Palermos and hoping that the, eventually the, consu the customers, the business customers of Palermo's will end up mm -hmm. forcing Palermo's to allow a vote without the workers wanting it. So it, uh, it's a whole, backdoor uh, approach okay, to unionization. I, I don't understand that, see, because Palermo says we're okay with the vote. So are they actually saying we don't want to have the vote we might lose, we want you to impose the union without an election? If, they can, that get that, if they can get yeah. that, yes, but bottom line, they're trying to build up enough public fervor yeah. that they end up getting enough votes to have the or, vote happen. Or to hire back yeah. some of the people yes. who are fired, then yes. they'll have and enough people. Have enough. Yeah, Alexander, how is this playing out? It if we're talking about hiring back people who were let go, but they were undocumented workers, how can that even be a possible road to go down? I, I mean, it seems like they're trying to, uh, Voices de la Frontera is trying to make a disconnect between whether you're uh, legally in the country well, or allowed see, to work. Th th this you can't is, this is the key, the this yeah, this this is is the key point. You get the votes, right. then yeah. you embarrass yeah. a company. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what you but do. I don't, but, uh, but, I think, but I think when they show up at, at the family home in the neighborhood, that is not going to win hearts and minds. I think that that is going to uh, further discredit Voches. Yeah, and I think Deanna mm -hmm, makes the key point here is that they are demanding that the company do something that would put them in, in direct violation with federal law. It, is, it really doesn't make that much sense. So is what they said this week the same thing as what you heard? Let's go around the table. Linda Bruin. Well, last week, Frontier Airlines announced that they were going to charge $100 for their passengers to put a bag in the overhead uh, bins. Yeah. And when they said it, they said Ooh. that this would make their customers ultimately much happier. What I heard was that they think that their passengers are so dumb that they can, that they can get away with this. Deanna. President Obama and the FDA said that they want 15-year-old girls to be able to get the morning after pill on their own without mom and dad's approval. But what I heard President Obama and the FDA say is that they can parent our children better than we can. Hmm. Michael. Mm. County Exec Chris Abley vetoed the county board reform measure, saying it was impractical and probably illegal. What I actually heard was, do you hear that sound? That's the fat lady singing. Ooh. Ryan Fraley. Ooh. Okay. The Journal Sentinel said, evidence doesn't support school choice uh, program expansion. Uh, what I heard was the evidence we choose to cherry pick says that we should just accept the status quo at MPS. Okay, so what they said was unemployment dropped to 7.5%. What I heard was that more people are working part-time jobs and part-timers are seeing their hours being cut because of Obamacare. That's the new normal. Next on Sunday Insight, our panel picks the winners and losers of the week. But first, here's your morning news update. It's time for our panel to pick the winners and losers of the week. Linda Bruin, you're first. Leroy Butler is my winner for having common sense and compassion both on and off the field. My loser is Governor Walker for his budget provision that allows rent-to-own companies to hide their interest rates. His willingness to help those, these companies stick it to Wisconsin residents shows little compassion or common sense. Deanna Alexander. 
A cybersecurity bill that would turn the websites that we all love into government spies has been stalled in the Senate. So my winner is every American that cares about their privacy. Our children are the losers, though. As adults debated school funding and gun laws, there was a baby found discarded in a cooler at a recycling plant. Michael Holt. Uh, the black community lost three true black history maker leaders in the last couple of weeks. Dr. Anthony Menza, Fairbanks Cooper, and Larry Howell, the mm -hmm. architect of the school choice measure. On the positive side, I guess we could say that at least we get an opportunity to sit at their feet. Brian Fraley. Pressing for access for public records in Madison, uh, pushing MATC to obey Act 10, protecting free speech for the residents of the town of Morrison. For these fights and others, the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty is my winner of the week. The union agitators at Voces de la Frontera are losers. Okay, my, uh, my, my winner, Palermo's, a great family-owned business, a classic American success story, a great corporate citizen and employer, wins a total legal victory when the NLRB rejects accusations that the company had violated union laws. So they now can move forward with the vote where workers can decide if they want to join the union or not. My loses, same thing as Brian. Voces de la Frontera, the radical unionist front group whose complaint against Palermo's was slam dunked this week. Their plans to protest the private residence of the company's CEO could mark the point at which the public finally loses patience with them. Thanks for joining us and joining me for my radio show Monday morning on News Radio 620 WTMJ from 8.30 until noon. Have a great week.